to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. We have a very special guest today and a very interesting book. You know, it wasn't the first attempt at telling the story of the Buddha and taking it to the world. Yet the light of Asia was quite a spectacular success. Uh, in today's parlance, it is a book or a work that went viral and introduced the Buddha to the Western world. Why did that happen? What was so special about this book? That's the question that uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, renowned author, and of course, we know him as ex-minister, Rajya Sabha member and politician. He's tried uh, an attempt to find, attempted to find out the reason behind the light of Asia success. Remember it was a poem by Sir Edwin Arnold uh, uh, published in the late 19th century. And in many senses, it kind of acted as a milestone in our understanding or appreciation of uh, the Buddhist world because it actually had such a cascading impact beyond. Jairam Ramesh joins us now. Uh, many thanks for joining us. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, last time we spoke, we were talking about Krishna Menon at the Kala Ghoda Festival. And I must tell you, I was completely blown away by this book because I've always seen you from a journalist's vantage point talking about politics, economics, or you know, the making of India post-1991. So I was very pleasantly surprised by this book. So my first question is, what made you go on a quest in search of the light of Asia and the backstory to it? Well, you know, the life of the Buddha, you know, has fascinated me, captivated me. It captivates all Indians. Uh, Buddha is uh, hardwired into the Indian DNA, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I've always been interested. I'm not a Buddhist or a, or a scholar of Buddhism by any means, but the life of the Buddha has, you know, has, has held special meaning for me as it does, as mm -hmm. I said, for almost all Indians. Uh, and this was a poem that I read when I was a child, when I was uh, very young, and it remained with me. And over the years, you know, as I read more about Buddhism and the life of the Buddha, out of sheer intellectual interest, uh, I began to be aware of the importance of this poem. It was a milestone in Buddhist historiography. It was published in 1879. Uh, and as you very rightly said, uh, it went viral <laughs> in 1879. It went viral in England. It went viral in Europe. It went uh, viral in America. And it went super viral in Asia, in China, Japan, Korea, uh, Ceylon, Siam, I mean, Thailand, today's Thailand, and of course, India. Mm. So this was an attempt uh, on my part to understand uh, why this book, uh, why this poem, uh, exercised such an extraordinary influence uh, on our thinking and on our understanding and on our appreciation of the life of Buddha. Uh, now, this is a two-in-one biography, Mini. It's a biography of the poem, but it's also a biography of the author. Uh, you know, I can't divorce the poet from the poem. And the author is also a fascinating character a great believer in British rule in India, a Victorian imperialist uh, in every sense of the term, but completely in love with India's civilization legacy. He translated the Hitopadesha, he translated the Mahabharata, he translated the Geet Govinda, and most importantly, many, in 1885, he translated the Bhagavad Gita uh, mm -hmm. as the song celestial, which became one of the defining texts for Mahatma Gandhi for the rest of his life. I set out to discover why the poem was influential, The Light of Asia. And I also you know, set out to unravel the life uh, of this curiously ambivalent uh, you know, orientalist of the late 19th century. Right. And as you point out, there's just been one biography, I think, of Edwin Arnold, but I really found it fascinating because of many interesting aspects, you know. The first is, of course, he came to India around 1857. He was a principal of the Deccan College, some a place that I love because it's now the Deccan College of Archaeology. But that apart, you know, 
his life is so interesting because he was, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a separate quest, list of questions for the body of work he did across philosophies, which is just mind blowing. But what is also interesting about this man is that he was a journalist, he was a poet, and he almost became the poet laureate uh, under uh, the Victorian administration after the death of Lord Tennyson. And um, he packed in so much uh, in his life. So what was he like as a person? Because before I talk about the light of Asia, let's talk about how he got to the light of Asia. Well, you know, he came to India in 1857, mm -hmm. November of 1857, and stayed here for 26 months as principal of Pune College, which later became the Deccan College. Uh, he obviously had a remarkable, um, you know, uh, felicity with languages, Greek, Latin, French, German, uh, Persian, uh, but most importantly for our conversation, Sanskrit uh, and Marathi. You know, he fell in love with these languages, became uh, proficient in these two languages. Uh, and as principal of Deccan College, of Pune College, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really became aware of India's literary uh, treasures, literary classics, uh, and fell in love with India's uh, cultural legacy, you know, uh, which he defined uh, as a composite legacy. You know, he translates uh, what are quote unquote Hindu works. Mm -hmm. He's written this great epic poem on the life of the Buddha. And he also translated uh, from the Arabic, which he knew, the 99 names of Allah. So, you know, his trilogy was uh, Hind translations of what are we consider to be Hindu works like the Gita Govinda, Hitopadesha, Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita. Then, of course, the Light of Asia, which is, you know, to, to deal with the life of Buddha and uh, the 99 names of Allah. So he was... Uh, he was a journalist. He was not an academic. He was not a scholar by any means. He was the editor of the Daily Telegraph for over 25 years, a very influential journalist. Uh, the poets didn't think much of him. They thought of him as a minor poet hmm. because he, you know, dabbled in Orientalism far yeah. too much. You know, his, most of his poems were not in English. I mean, they were in English, but they were translations of Sanskrit, Persian or Arabic or Turkish for that matter. Uh, uh, you know, he was married three times. Um, he fell in love with a, with a Japanese who was 37 years younger to him. Uh, and the last, you know, 10 years of his life, uh, she lived with him. And she, of course, passes away only in 1962, mm -hmm. outlived him by almost 55, 56 years. Uh, so he became a great lover of Japanese culture uh, for the last 10, 15 years of his life, like he was a lover of Indian culture. So obviously, you know, he was a Victorian. He lived in London. Uh, he epitomized all the great Victorian values, you know, the believer in the Raj, believer in the modernizing mission of uh, the British uh, establishment in the subcontinent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, a great popularizer uh, of India's cultural and literary uh, legacy. Right. So I find him very ambivalent, you know, yeah. and this is where I part company with my friend Shashi Tharoor. You know, <laughs> Shashi Tharoor condemns that whole generation of Britishers uh, as imperialists and colonialists. Uh, but I think uh, there were in the 19th century, uh, a generation of Britishers who were imperialists and colonialists, no doubt, but at the same time were steeped uh, in Indian culture, was steeped in Indian literary, uh, you know, and uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage, uh, art, architecture, music, painting, uh, texts. Uh, and Edwin Arnold uh, epitomized that. Today, the word Orientalist is a bad word, uh, but he was an Orientalist in the best sense of the term in the late 19th century. Right. You know, I, when I was reading about Edwin Arnold, I, I couldn't but think, you know, he was a journalist, so he obviously would, had a great way of writing, but he had to have a very deep sense of philosophy and understanding of it to be able to do the body of work he did, because it wasn't just a literary classic, it was also summarizing and beautifully putting together the philosophy, uh, the complex philosophy, the complex web of philosophies across faiths, because as you rightly said, it started with Gita Govindam, we went to the, uh, the light of Asia, uh, talked about uh, Islam, 
went to uh, the, the song Celestial, which is a Bhagavad Gita. Now, each one was very deep in, in their own sense. So when you were working on him, what, what sense did you get of the man? Because I mean, well, he was obviously, you know, he was, uh, he was, a, he was a doubting Thomas when it came to the church. Uh, you know, he was deeply, deeply, I mean, he was not steeped in Christianity. Uh, in fact, uh, he was criticized for writing The Light of Asia. Uh, and to compensate for, uh, to meet that criticism and to bolster his credentials to be the poet laureate after Lord Tennyson, he wrote another long epic poem called Light of the World mm -hmm. on the life of Christ. And that book completely bombed. You know, it just didn't, uh, it didn't take off. Uh, so the appetite in the 19th century was not for Christ. The appetite in the late 19th century uh, for was was for a Buddha-like figure, a, a, a figure uh, whom people could relate to, uh, you know, as a moral anchor, as a spiritual anchor, as a philosophical anchor, but not as somebody who was preaching a dogma or a creed or was imposing an institution like the church or the pope. Uh, you know, and uh, clearly the sense I got from, you know, reading Edwin Arnold's papers and his, his correspondence, which are scattered all over the world in different archives, uh, is a man, you know, great believer in science. Uh, this was also the period many remember the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. This is the post Darwin period. Uh, this is the period in which science uh, is progressing rapidly. There is growing doubt uh, on Christianity, on organized church. And this was also the period of growing economic prosperity uh, in the West particularly. I'll come to India separately, but I think the reason why this poem really became a sensation on India is somewhat different than in what happened in the West. Uh, in the West, uh, there was a hunger, there was an appetite for a Buddha-like figure. Uh, and remember, that the 19th century was also the century of poems, of long poetry. Um, the poets were knighted. Authors were not knighted. Uh, Edwin Arnold is Sir Edwin Arnold. Charles Dickens is not Sir Charles Dickens. Uh, you know, he was just Charles Dickens. He was not Sir Charles Dickens. He was Sir Lord Tennyson. You know, Sir Edwin Arnold. Uh, so there was something about poetry. Uh, and poetry was very much part of the empire uh, you know, uh, empire thinking, empire project, empire enterprise. Uh, of course, you know, all that is over. That I'm talking now of the late 19th century. So I was a romantic, uh, great believer in science, as I said. Uh, and um, I think he, he was not a Buddhist. He was certainly not a Buddhist. He didn't formally become a Buddhist. Uh, but amongst all the faiths, uh, that you know he was aware of uh, i think he was most attracted to the life of the buddha